Yeah, so as Dr. Stedman mentioned today, we're going to talk about small, single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, Ken may have exaggerated a little because he knows seemingly everything about everything, so I'll do my best to convince you that I maybe know as much as him about single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, so we're going to go through this kind of in the same way that Dr. Stedman likes to um, present other viruses uh, to you as a class. So we'll look at, we'll start by looking at parvoviruses, we'll look where they came from, we'll look at uh, structure in terms of virions, genome, um, we'll kind of get into cells, we'll talk in a little bit of detail about something I'm not sure if you've talked about, discussed yet, we'll talk about susceptible versus permissive cells, how that relates to different types of infections that are possible, things that you guys have done a lot of, we'll look at how mRNA and in turn proteins get made by these viruses, we'll look at how they make more of their genomes, and we'll look at a couple interesting things that um, these small single-stranded DNA viruses, a couple interesting structures that they have in terms of their genome that allow them to replicate the ends of DNA. Uh, we'll talk about why these viruses are dependent on cell cycle. We'll distinguish between what are called dependo and autonomous viruses. And we'll look at a little bit um, of applications that these viruses may have as potential um, agents to deliver anti-cancer drugs. So that's all parvoviruses. And we'll talk about Gemini viruses, and we'll talk about the viruses that I work on, which are called cruciviruses. Again, all small, single-stranded DNA viruses, but different small single-stranded DNA viruses, and we'll do the same, same pattern for these here. All right, so hopefully everybody's familiar with this. You probably saw this at some point in principles of, principles of biology, maybe cell biology, maybe even molecular biology, but this is the cell cycle. So you have G1, an S phase, S, you guys remember what S stands for? I heard somebody say it's synthesis. Synthesis of what? DNA, right? So during the S phase, more DNA gets made. You have G2, and then the phase in which cells divide. So since everybody knows that S is for synthesis, when would DNA polymerases be present during the cell cycle? Probably during the S phase, right? Because if you're Synthesizing DNA, you probably need DNA polymerases around, which leads to this kind of open-ended question that hopefully we'll have an answer to here in the next uh, half hour or so. If you, you, are a virus that lacks your own polymerases, DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases, when and where would you find your niche within the cell cycle? So what I'm hoping to convince you is that these viruses are heavily dependent on the S phase because they need DNA and RNA polymerases to be provided by the cell. Okay, so origins of kind of the original small single-stranded DNA viruses of eukaryotes. You guys have probably talked about um, single-stranded DNA viruses of bacteriophage, or sorry, of, of bacteria, the bacteriophage. Um, particularly Lambda. So where these viruses were origi originally discovered um, was when people were looking for viruses that could lead to um, cancer development. So what people would do is they would take lab rodents, um, they in would inject them with tumor material or oncogenic material, and then they would screen the viruses that they were able to re-extract from these rodents. And a lot of the time the assumption was made that the viruses that they in turn isolated once uh, these oncogenic processes were started, were responsible for the cancers that developed. But as it turned out, parvoviruses, which are the small single-stranded DNA viruses that we'll use kind of as our um, example, weren't oncogenic. Instead, they were oncotrophic, and as it turns out later, they were realized to be oncolytic. So does anybody know what oncotrophic means? in general terms. So Dr. Stedman, who, like I said, knows everything, knows what it means. But if you break down the word, so 
How about tropisms? Do people know what tropism means? So I think that the simplest way to describe oncotrophic just means that these viruses have a propensity or a desire to infect um, cancer cells. Probably the reason for that is that cancer cells are kind of stuck in what phase of the cell cycle? S phase, right? Because they're constantly synthesizing stuff, rapidly dividing. And so what it turned out was that these viruses were, their replication was dependent on the cell cycle, like I mentioned, because that's when DNA polymerases are present. So we're going to look at a couple different types of these small single-stranded DNA viruses. So we're going to look at what are called autonomous viruses and dependoviruses. So autonomous small single-stranded DNA viruses are able to induce a shift into the S phase of the cell cycle. Autonomous means they're able to do this themselves. The dependoviruses are dependent on what's called a helper virus to shift the cell into the S phase of the cell cycle. So you guys, I think, have probably talked about adenovirus. And so an example of a dependovirus is the adeno-associated virus. The adeno-associated virus is not able to stimulate the cell cycle, but adenoviruses are. And so in that case, we refer to the adeno-associated virus as a dependovirus. And the adenovirus itself is the helper virus relative to the adeno-associated virus. It's kind of a mouthful there. All right, so what do these viruses actually look like? Well, as I mentioned, they're small. Some of the smallest virions um, that are currently described, so 28 nanometers in diameter, about. Parvus, Latin, means small. Um, I have a T equals one naked acosahedral capsid. You guys know Dr. Sedman loves comparison questions on tests. So you can think about what are the H and K values that would result in a T equals one structure or the possible H and K values. What other viruses look like this? Things, things of that nature are good to keep in mind for the final that comes up here in a couple weeks. They have approximately a 5 KB linear, in quotes, single-stranded DNA genome with hairpin ends. And the reason that linear is in quotes is because of the secondary structures and the hairpin ends that exist at the 5 prime and 3 prime ends of these genomes, which we'll, we'll take a look at in a minute. Again, because they're, they're small in diameter, they can only encapsulate a small genome. And so that genome only encodes three to seven proteins. Uh, the cryostructure presented here of one of these small single-stranded DNA viruses, um, you can see that there's a density associated with some of these capsid proteins here, which implies that these capsid proteins probably interact with DNA to actively package it. All right, so this is kind of a slide just of pure text that you guys have probably seen 30 times by now this quarter, right? How do these viruses get into cells? Well, the answer is the way that a lot of other viruses get into cells. So minute virus of mice gets in via sialic acid, so it binds to sialic acid, and then is endocytosed into the, into the cell. Remember, good test questions. Dr. Sedman might like to ask what other viruses get into cells this way as well. <laughs> well, the answer here is, is, you know, 20 other potential viruses that you guys have probably looked at this year. Uh, adeno-associated virus, a whole bunch of different um, receptors that mediate endocytosis. So once these cells, or sorry, once these viruses get into um, a host cell, they're not an infection isn't started until these viruses are able to actually enter the nucleus. So they get into the nucleus via um, nuclear pores, and they're uncoated at the nucleus. So they travel through the cell. Once they arrive at the nucleus, they uncoat and release their genomes into the nucleus, which is where all those enzymes that they don't, that these viruses don't make themselves, are present. DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases. Um, things of that nature. So it's this uncoding at the nucleus that depend, or that determines which cell types are actually infectable by these, by these viruses. 
So that leads to um, the concept of permissive, non-permissive, and susceptible cells. So basically just a slide full of definitions. So cells that have correct extracellular receptors are known as susceptible because they are susceptible to viral entry. So if you back up to that previous slide and look at the list of um, receptors on that side, cells that have those receptors are able to take in endocytos, these small single-stranded DNA viruses. Cells with the correct machinery for replication are permissive. So correct, by correct machinery, I mean that these viruses are able to actively get into the nucleus and then in the nucleus, um, the machinery that's present to make RNA, to make more DNA, is compatible with what these viruses present to the cell. So you can have a case where susceptible and permissive cells are distinct from each other. And so for a successful, from the virus's point of view, natural infection, a host cell has to be susceptible, so the virus has to be able to get in, has to be able to uncoat at the nucleus, making that cell permissive. So it's been discovered that for these viruses, uncoating at the nucleus, the introduction of the viral genome to the nucleus is actually the critical step. So canine parvovirus, so if anybody's had puppy canine parvovirus is something that your little puppy gets immunized, hopefully for, because it leads to um, diarrheal diseases, dehydration, things like that, and it can be pretty severe. But canine parvovirus can enter feline cells, so cat cells. So the feline cells have the correct extracellular receptors that lead to this viral particle being endocytosed, but it's blocked at the step of getting into the nucleus. So these cells would be susceptible. This virus actually makes it inside the cell, but they're non-permissive because they, the virus and the DNA replication machinery are, are not, they don't talk to each other. They don't work together to make more canine parvovirus in feline cells. While naked DNA transformed into, or transfected into these um, naked canine parvovirus DNA transfected into feline cells is able to replicate, which implicates encoding at the nucleus as the limiting step here. So from that, you can see that canine parvovirus can enter permissive and non-permissive cells. Where it can establish a natural infection, though, is a susceptible and permissive cell. If you have questions, just get my attention and I'll do my best to, to answer them as we go. Okay, so what do the genomes of these small single-stranded DNA viruses look like? Up top, we have minute virus of mice, which is an autonomous virus. Down below, we have adeno-associated virus, which is a dependovirus. So generally, they have small genomes with very few genes. We talked about that probably in part due to the fact that they have very small physical virions. So in order to make the, um, the proper proteins that this virus needs to make more of itself, there's a couple um, techniques or strategies that these genomes employ. So there's lots of splicing and alternative start codons. So you guys, again, probably talked about virus um, transcription and translation techniques, but what other viruses use lots of splicing, what other viruses use alternative start codons. So I don't know, when, when I was an undergrad, nobody ever taught me how to read these maps. It was always just assumed that we knew how to read these for some reason. But what you have here is a map that shows um, mRNA. So mRNA is the, the line. The arrows, or the triangles, are splicing of mRNA, make mature mRNA, and then the blocks are what's actually translated from, from these mRNAs. And so you can see that there's from one mRNA of one size that's generated from the P4 promoter, you end up through differential splicing of this large internal region here, you end up with two different proteins being made from the same mRNA. So these are NS1 and NS2, 
So the NS means non-structural. These non-structural proteins are generally located on the um, five prime or left half of these genomes. So the non-structural proteins are responsible for, um, they mediate, we'll say, genome replication. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. And the BP1, BP2, and or 3 in the case of an associated virus are made from a different promoter, P38. Again, there's also differential splicing here um, that leads to BP1, BP2 being made from the same, same mRNA. So the VPs, for those of you that are taking either Dr. Stedman's um, literature discussion course or the, the lab associated loosely with that, you know that these are proteins that make up the actual capsid, right, the, the physical virion structure. So the takeaway here is that there's a small number of genes relatively small number of promoters as well, and that differential splicing is what leads to different mRNAs, in turn, what leads to different proteins being made. You'll see that VP2 and VP3 are actually, they look pretty similar on this map, and we'll take a closer look at that, that those um, in a minute. All right, so what do the genomes actually physically look like? So we know that they're single-stranded DNA, but there's a high degree of self-complementarity at the ends of these genomes. So this is just looking at the three prime end. Five prime end is somewhere over here off the screen, but you can see that there's self-complementarity here, and we have what are called these terminal hairpin ends. And what you'll notice is that there's a free three prime, it's found at the three prime ends of DNA. An OH, right? So there's a free three prime OH here, which can be used conveniently as um, a primer for replication. So this is a new, I think, new to this course, um, strategy for replicating viral genomes. You've probably talked about DNA primed, you've probably talked about protein primed. Now we have an example of self-priming replication here, and we'll look at that um, in more detail. What these terminal hairpins do is they take away the problem, or they, we'll say, they mediate the problem of how do you replicate DNA in. So in eukaryotes, we're probably all familiar with um, telomerase. That's how eukaryotic cells deal with replicating DNA ends. Another way is to just get rid of DNA ends, right, and have circular DNA. In the case of these small single-stranded DNA viruses, they've evolved what are called terminal, because they're at the ends, hairpin, hairpin structures to deal with DNA end replication. All right, so we'll go through and look at replication, then we're going to jump to transcription, and we'll come back to replication because they're, they're interrelated. All right, so I mentioned that the genome is able to serve as a primer, right, because you have a free 3 prime OH here. The other end, you have 5 prime phosphate, but it's the 3 prime OH that we're interested in um, as far as DNA replication is concerned. So the first step when these viruses are successfully uncoded at the nucleus is for a transcriptional template to be made. In order to make mRNA from DNA, you have to have double-stranded DNA. So this 3' OH is used by cellular DNA polymerases, and it's extended, <coughs> making a new strand of DNA, and it'll break down these terminal hairpin ends at the other end results in a double-stranded genome, temporary double-stranded genome, which is capable of serving as a template for transcription. So you'll notice that these hairpin ends are labeled with A, A prime, B, and C, so we'll keep track of these when we start looking at replication. Okay, so we just saw Initially, single-stranded DNA is converted to double-stranded DNA. 
Now that the terminal 3 prime OH is used as the primer, DNA polymerase extends from there. And so now we're ready to make mRNA. So mRNA can be made with a variety of different transcription factors. Um, you have cellular transcription factors, so E2F, common SP1, ETS, you have the TATA binding protein site here. And there's also um, cellular proteins that can serve as transcription factors as well. So NS1, non-structural protein 1, which is also the rep protein, can also serve as a transcription factor. And so all these, we'll look at briefly how to read maps again real quick. So all these box locations are transcription factor binding sites. And then this arrow pointing downstream indicates where the transcriptional start site actually is. Um, so we talked about all the different splicing that can happen in these, these viruses that leads to them being able to make a larger number of proteins relative to their genome size. For AAV, VP2 and VP3 employ another strategy where there's actually alternative start codons. So there's an ACG for VP2 versus AUG for VP3, which leads to more transcription happening from the AUG, which leads to more of VP3 being present relative to uh, VP2. Then from there, things proceed as normally. Um, mRNA gets made in the nucleus, travels out, and is translated into proteins. Really, for us, the only two proteins that are really important, I think, are the proteins that will make the capsid and the proteins that will mediate replication. All right, so I briefly mentioned that in order to overcome the problem of DNA and replication, there's a couple different things that organisms do. Um, so initially, right, you have Traditionally, an RNA primer extended to the 3 prime. These segments of RNA are removed, and DNA polymerase can fill in where there's a free 3 prime OH. But the ends were missing a free 3 prime OH that DNA polymerase can use um, to begin adding new nucleotides. So, again, in eukaryotes, telomerase reverse transcriptase activity is able to help us overcome this problem. I mentioned you can also just have circular genome. If you don't want to deal with DNA ends, why not just get rid of them altogether? But in the case of these viruses, we have hairpin ends. All right, so this kind of marches us through um, DNA replication of these small, single-stranded DNA viruses. So this gray dot here uh, represents the NS or rep proteins for these small single-stranded DNA viruses. Okay, so we saw initially that the DNA is formed using this self-priming 3 prime OH here, so the genome primes and serves as a template for its own replication. We saw DNA polymerase extend new strand, breaking down the hairpin ends at the 5 prime end. So now we have a double-stranded piece of DNA. And this is where these rep proteins actually come into play. So this protein is depicted here associated with the 5 prime end of the genome because there are um, instances where this protein will get packaged in the actual virion. Other times it won't, depending on, on the virus. So here, double-stranded DNA genome. What this rep protein does is it introduces a NIC. And so a NIC is a single-stranded DNA break. And this NIC is introduced exactly opposite of where this original 3 prime OH was. This NIC is introduced in a sequence-dependent manner. So this protein recognizes a specific DNA se sequence here and makes a single-stranded break. Again, NS1, non-structural, or Rep 7868, depending on which small single-stranded DNA virus we're talking about. 
So then this rep protein will unwind these hairpin ends through helicase activity, right? Helicases unwind DNA, which results in a template that cellular DNA polymerases can then use to replicate out to the ends here. Once, um, once you have replication extended to the end of the strand, the hairpin ends will reform here. Then you have another template that can be used. So you keep track of the arrow, the arrow. You have another template that can be used um, to make more of to make more of these viruses. So as DNA polymerase extends along here, it displaces this top strand. So this top strand gets <coughs> displaced, and this top strand can then be packaged um, as a new new virus. Again, you can see that the rep protein here is staying associated with the genome. And so if you follow these sequences, the A, A prime, what you'll notice is that from the beginning to the end, they get, um, or sorry, if you follow the Bs and the Cs, you'll notice that they get inverted. Um, that's just a, a product of base pairing. So if you write this out, you do the ATCG, you, you can follow it, follow it along. So the important thing here, I think, is to note what the protein that's named, the replication protein, does and doesn't do, right? It doesn't have any DNA polymerase activity. We're dependent on the cellular DNA polymerases for that. It just has DNA nicking activity. It has DNA unwinding activity, helicase activity as related to um, DNA replication. It also can bind origin, so that's related to DNA replication, so the, or the origin is where DNA replication begins. It can also bind promoters and act as a transcription factor. Um, so there's a couple domains that are generally associated with these proteins. One is um, generally in the N-terminal domain, you have motifs that are responsible for that nicking activity, and then the C, towards the C terminus, you have domains and motifs that are responsible for helicase activity. Um, so we saw how it's a specific endonuclease, right? We saw that it binds to DNA at specific sequences and introduces that single-stranded break or nick at the origin. We talked about how it can be a transcriptional activator, right? We saw those maps a few slides ago about where it binds in the genome can also be a cell cycle blocker, so it can mediate or regulate transcription of cellular genes. And we know that this is important um, for arresting cells in the S phase, so keeping DNA polymerases present to make as many of these viruses as possible. And as I mentioned, because it oftentimes associates with um, newly made genomes, it can also end up in the virion. So calling it a non-structural protein might be not entirely true, but we'll, we'll stick with that because that's what everybody else likes. Okay, so we I mentioned at the beginning that some of these small single-stranded DNA viruses are capable of stimulating cell cycle on their own and others aren't. The ones that aren't are referred to as dependoviruses and they need virus in order to actually stimulate uh, the cell cycle. So E1A is a protein that's provided by one of these helper viruses, specifically uh, adenovirus. What E1A does is it mimics, or takes the place rather, of cyclin-dependent kinases. So CDKs um, will phosphorylate retinoblastoma, which removes it from E2F. Once that happens, E2F is able to uh, mediate transcription, which leads to an entering into the S phase because of the correct uh, proteins being present that's transcribed here. Adenovirus, E1A is able to mimic CDKs, and it's able to sequester retinoblastoma away from E2F, which leads to an induction of the cell cycle. 
couple other proteins, um, E1B, E4, that are provided by adenovirus that ensure that cells stay in the cell cycle. And then finally, um, RNA provided by adenoviruses block PKR, which is a um, nucleic acid mediated response, specifically an RNA. It's a response to viral RNA, essentially. And so by kind of distracting the cell, by sending out this um, fake target for it to look at and to go after adenovirus and its dependoviruses are able to more effectively escape cell, cell defenses. So if there aren't, if a adeno-associated virus, a dependovirus, infects the cell and there isn't a helper virus, there's no adenovirus infection, co-infection taking place, sometimes these adeno-associated viruses can actually integrate into <coughs> host genomes. So this happens in a, a method similar to what is seen in bacteriophage lambda. Um, you get the replication of the first strand, right, that top strand that we saw leads to the formation of double-stranded DNA. And then it's not clear how these viruses actually integrate into the host genomes. Perhaps this integration is medi mediated by the rep or non-structural proteins or potentially um, cellular enzymes mediate that. So because these small single-stranded DNA viruses are um, oncotrophic, there's the potential that maybe they could be used for things like cancer therapies. So rep NS1 is toxic to cancer cells, so just the, the natural proteins that these um, viruses produce, potentially could be useful in cancer therapies. Um, parvovirus infection doesn't induce an interferon response in cancer cells, so they're able to avoid detection. They can persist in these cancer cells. Um, terminal hairpin ends look like damaged DNA because they're partially single-stranded, partially double-stranded, which can lead to um, programmed cell death. And finally, because these viruses are oncotrophic, there's the potential that you could put your favorite anti-cancer anti protein packaged in a single-stranded DNA virus that would be effectively, um, relatively effectively targeted to cancer cells and not healthy cells in your body. That's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. I would guess that they are also harmful to other cells. All right, so what have we seen for small single-stranded DNA viruses? Well, I think the important things are the hairpin ends. So how do these viruses overcome the problem of replicating DNA ends? We talked a little bit about susceptible versus permissive cells. And the fact that a susceptible cell can allow a virus to enter, a permissive cell allows the virus to replicate. We talked about the fact that for these small single-stranded DNA viruses, the important step is the encoding at the nucleus. We know that because these viruses don't encode their own polymerases, they are dependent on the presence of cellular polymerases, which are only present during the S phase. And finally, we saw how integration potentially can happen if a dependovirus doesn't have a helper virus co-infecting the same cell. All right, so we're going to switch gears here a little. So we've gone through um, parvoviruses. We're going to talk about another couple classes of single-stranded DNA viruses, we'll look at another type of single-stranded DNA replication as well. All right, so we're going to talk briefly first about single-stranded DNA viruses that infect plants. So most plant-infecting viruses are positive-sense single-stranded RNA viruses. 
But the Gemini viruses are, I think Dr. Stedman may have mentioned these to you, they have a really neat um, physical virion structure, a really strange structure that we'll look at in a couple slides. But they're also neat or interesting because they cause very economically um, important plant diseases. So you can get symptoms like stunting, leaf abnormalities, yield reductions, so on. So they cause diseases that are important to um, commercial agriculture. And these, it's been put out there that these diseases or these viruses were probably first described thousands of years ago um, in a Japanese poem that described plants that had autumn colors in summer. And so if you look at some of these symptoms, specifically the ones on the next page, you'll see that the symptoms can look like um, senescence in plants, kind of similar to these um, symptoms here. But the nature of the virion and the genome weren't figured out for a couple thousand more years, not until the mid-1970s. So the nice thing, the nice thing about plant viruses is that they're really easy to name. The way that they are generally named is you look at the plant and ask, what does the plant look like? And then you name the virus after that. So here is a tomato plant. Its leaves are kind of yellow and they're curled. So we would name the virus that causes this tomato yellow leaf curl virus. These are grape vines. They're red, their leaves are red. They have a blotchy pattern to them. So this is grapevine leaf blotch virus. This is another tomato plant. In this case, the leaves are curled, usually only at the top. So we call this tomato pseudo curly top virus. Really easy, really simple, easy to keep track of things. So these are economically important um, diseases that Gemini virus, single-stranded DNA viruses cause that generally lead to not getting as much tomatoes from a plant, not getting enough wine grapes from a plant, eventually, potentially plant death. Yeah? So we'll look at the next slide and then come back to that. So they're generally found in agriculture, but there are times where their symptoms are actually desirable. So this is um, more Gemini virus symptoms. So you can see the, the modeling or the mosaic pattern that these leaves have. So this is um, abutilon mosaic virus. So abutilon, um, people are probably maybe familiar with flowering maples. So this is um, kind of the, the type member of the abutilon species. So these symptoms are associated with desirable traits. And so these are positively selected by breeders and propagators to have their plants infected with these viruses that lead to these nice, um, nice appearing leaves. So yes, they're generally associated with agriculture, but they're also associated with um, other plants that aren't agriculturally important, but might be culturally important or have um, desirable characteristics. Does that answer your question? Okay, so what do the, the physical virions look like? They are two fused, T equals one, incomplete icosahedra. They're joined at a missing CP subunit. So you can see here they're joined kind of in the middle where one capsid protein is missing. They're about 18 by 30 nanometers across. So still pretty, pretty small. Um, there's their single-stranded DNA genome. All right, so I'll well, back up a slide here. So you can see that where we have two particles, two fused particles to make one virion, there's only one single-stranded DNA genome associated with these. There are some Gemini viruses that are bipartite. So the Bogomo viruses have two DNAs encapsulated by two different fused twinned virions. So DNA A and DNA B are both required for a successful 
from the, again, from the virus's point of view, a successful infection. So DNA A contains genes for rep protein. It's also sometimes referred to as AC1. And this rep protein mediates replication of these genomes by rolling circle replication. We'll talk about RCR later. Again, it can also act as a transcription factor to keep plant cells in S phase. So it's this rep protein that's responsible for mediating replication of both DNA A and DNA B. See that DNA B doesn't encode a rep. What it does is um, encodes proteins that are important for systemic infection. So I don't know if you talked about this, but Generally, um, plant viruses, in order to move within their host, they don't necessarily need to be encapsulated, encapsulated in a virion. A lot of plant viruses will encode what's called a movement protein, which mediates movement of naked genomes through the plasmodesmata that connect plant cells. Then back on DNA A, we also have the capsid protein. So it's this capsid protein that determines how this, um, how these bagomoviruses are able to interact with insects, how they're able to move from one plant to another. So generally, the Gemini viruses will be moved from one plant to another by small leafhopper insects or white flies. And so the capsid protein doesn't necessarily play an important role of moving systemically within a plant. It's about moving from one host, one plant to the next. So there's another level here that we can go deeper. So we saw Gemini viruses that are monopartite, one genome segment. We saw Gemini viruses, the bagomoviruses that have two genome segments. There are also bagomoviruses that have what are called satellites. So satellite DNA is either the alpha satellite DNA or the beta satellite DNA are DNAs that are often found in association. It seems now to be the rule these satellite DNAs are found in association with um, Gemini, specifically Bogomovirus infections. And they don't encode the capsid protein at all. So both the alpha satellite and beta satellite DNAs, in order to be encapsulated and moved, they're dependent on an infection by a Bogomovirus, and they borrow the Bogomovirus capsid protein to move from one, one uh, host to the next. You can see that the alpha satellites, they actually encode their own rep. Beta satellites don't. So the beta satellites are dependent on the rep provided by the Bogomovirus. The alpha satellites can replicate themselves. So you'll see here there's a, a strange little structure represented at the top of each of these genomes, and this is um, what's called a stem loop. So you have a stem and then a loop. And it's these structures that are important for replication by the rolling circle mechanism, which is how these single-stranded DNA viruses deal with DNA end replication. So the important thing that these beta satellites provide is the C1 protein, which seems to be involved in systemic infections, which leads to more severe symptoms than a bogomovirus infection on its own. All right, so those are small single-stranded DNA viruses of plants. There's also small single-stranded DNA viruses of animals. So the example that we'll use here is the porcine circovirus. So again, very small. Um, physical virion structure, these are actually the smallest, I believe, the smallest virions that are currently well described. Um, again, genomes are very small, only 1.7 KB. You can see that these genomes encode a rep, a capsid. Sometimes there's other open reading frames, but those other open reading frames aren't very well characterized. Again, we have a non-pictured stem loop here that's going to serve as our origin of replication. So just like the Gemini viruses cause economically important plant diseases, 
Circle viruses cause agriculturally important diseases, particularly in um, pigs, so a post-weaning disease. All right, so we're going to look at circle virus replication, but this is also um, relevant to Gemini viruses because Gemini viruses use the same mechanism for replicating their, their genomes. So we'll look at the rep protein in a little bit of detail. So if you look at infected pig cells in vitro and you ask what viral mRNAs are being made, what you find is two transcripts for rep being made. One is the full length, another is one that results from splicing. But in vitro, they seem to have the same function. That same function is binding to the origin of replication and again introducing a single-stranded break, a nick in the DNA. So on, again, on the N-terminal portion of the protein, you have, I should say, motifs that are necessary for DNA nicking to initiate replication. And at the end of replication, DNA joining. In the C-terminal portion of the protein is motif that's, sorry, the domain that has motifs that are responsible for DNA unwinding, helicase activity, and generally, generally these helicases will really chew through ATP, use a whole lot of ATP, so oftentimes you'll see them represented with some kind of NTPase domain or a, a, um, a P-loop domain. And so it's been hypothesized that this P-loop actually came from co-RNA viruses. So what does this look like in vitro? So if you take a labeled piece of DNA, whether that's fluorescently labeled or radioactively labeled piece of DNA that represents the sequence of this origin of replication, so the stem loop. So here it is, 61 nucleotides labeled in some manner. If we take a primer that represents that sequence and we incubate it with purified rep protein or the shorter rep protein. What you find is that over time, you'll see the appearance of a smaller piece of labeled DNA, which is indicative of this protein introducing a single-stranded break, a nick, releasing a smaller piece of DNA that can then be resolved on a gel. So you see that both rep, which is the full length, and rep prime, which is the shorter protein, seem to have this same activity. So what does rolling circle replication actually look like? So again, we start with the single-stranded genome. Somehow it gets made into a double-stranded form in the nucleus. So the primer that's used to move from single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA isn't clear. It's unknown how this process happens. What is clear is that, again, just like the other viruses, that, is that this process is dependent on cellular DNA polymerases. So here we are, double-stranded DNA has been made. Red arrow represents the rep protein. Rep protein, again, is going to introduce a single-stranded break, a nick here. You're going to free up or expose a 3'OH, which can serve as your primer. The rep protein remains associated with the 5' end of this genome. Now cellular polymerases can extend around, make a new genome. When we get to the end, this rep protein is now responsible for both sealing this green genome and releasing a single-stranded genome that can go off and be um, packaged into a new virion. And it's also going to be responsible for nicking, again, this sequence initiates the next round of DNA replication. So the reason that this stem loop is represented so often is because the stem loop is required for both the nicking and eventual joining that happens at the end of replication. So this process that we looked at in circoviruses can also be extended to back to Gemini viruses in plants. Are there questions on stuff? Okay, so to end, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about another class of single-stranded DNA viruses that we know a little bit less about. 
All right, so the picture here is a lake in Lassen Volcanic National Park, which is east of Redding, California, which is northern California. So here we are, Redding. It's about uh, 70 miles east of, of Redding. So if you're looking at this lake, you may think that it's not the most clear lake you've ever seen, and you would be right. So it's a low pH, high temperature lake. Um, it has purely microbial life from all three domains. The important thing for us is that it also, because this microbial life is present, it has viruses. So down at this end of the lake, the temperature's about 50 degrees Celsius. At this end, it gets a little warmer, closer, closer to boiling. So this is a little bit too cool for the viruses that Dr. Stedman's lab typically or historically studies. Um, so what they were interested in, though, was what viruses actually are in this environment. So a former student of Dr. Sedman's formed a metaviromic study, so he went to Boiling Springs Lake, he brought back samples, he extracted DNA, he size excluded all that microbial life that we were talking about, so that hopefully the majority of DNA that you're sequencing and looking at should be viral DNA. So he did these experiments, these preparations, only hoping, only intending, rather, to look at DNA viruses. So when he assembled everything, you can see the makeup here, lots of bacterial viruses represented in the sequence data, some archaeal viruses, eukaryotic viruses. These are all viruses that give, have homology to DNA viruses. And things that are contained in databases. But when he started looking closely, he found that there were some viruses that seemed to have homology to RNA viruses, which we would not expect if we were looking at just DNA, right? We expect that all the homology should be to DNA viruses because traditionally DNA viruses and RNA viruses don't recombine. They don't share genetic information with each other. So he found this, he was puzzled by this, and so he dug deeper and he was able to reconstruct the sequence of this that contained what looked like an RNA gene. He was able to go back to his DNA samples and using PCR, he was able to clone out of these samples the virus that contains these RNA sequences or these RNA-like sequences. And so what he found was that this is probably a single-stranded DNA virus based on the presence of a rep open reading frame or a putative rep protein that looks like is homologous to the rep proteins found in circoviruses. But strangely, the capsid protein is homologous to capsid proteins found in RNA viruses. So what you have is a small 4.1 KB single-stranded DNA virus that seems to have genes that traditionally are only found by single-stranded DNA viruses, that makes sense, but also a gene that traditionally, historically, was only found in single-stranded RNA viruses. And so this was named tentatively Boiling Springs Lake BSL RNA-DNA hybrid virus. So one of the, the points of confusion often creeps up is that the whole genome here now, at this point in evolutionary history, is composed of DNA. It's just that this gene for the capsid protein, when you run blast searches against things in the database, it hits only to capsid proteins that are found in RNA viruses. There's also two open reading frames. So open, an open reading frame is just, right, it's just a, a sequence of DNA that has a start codon and then somewhere distance further that makes sense in terms of how many amino acids we would be produced as an in-frame stop codon. So these two open reading frames, there's no homology to anything in the databases. And then to go with its circovirus-like rep protein, there's also a origin of replication that looks suspiciously similar to the origins of replication found in the porcine circoviruses. So here's our stem in a porcine circovirus. So you have ATGC 
base pairing that makes the stem. And then in the loop, you have a breakdown of, um, there's no ATGC base pairing. And these nine boxed nucleotides, referred to as the non-nucleotide sequence, are the ones that are really important for which rep protein can interact with what type of origin of replication. So what you'll notice is that the only difference between porcine circovirus stem loop and the Boiling Springs Lake non-nucleotide sequence is that this initial T has been replaced by an A here. The stem's also a little bit longer, and then the repeats that are found in the porcine circovirus are um, of a different sequence, and they're slightly separated. But looks pretty similar to um, what we see in the porcine circoviruses. So from this, Dr. Stedman and his student, Dr. Diemer, were able to publish a paper um, that describes this virus for the first time. So this was the first instance of this virus being properly described in metaviromic data, and the first instance of, instance of one of these viruses being cloned out of, of um, a sample. So there's a Korean paper where they looked at the metavirome of air from around the same time, maybe a year before this paper came out. And if you look closely at their data, they seem to have found things like this first, but they didn't believe their own data, and so they um, have a disclaimer in their data that, that these viruses probably aren't real or there's an error here. And so luckily for, for Dr. Sedman and Dr. Diemer, they had the patience and the wherewithal to go back and check these things and actually um, clone one of these viruses from the environment. So right now, all we have are genome sequences. We don't have, we don't know what the host is for these viruses, so we don't know very much about them, but we know that they're, they're out there. So Dr. Stedman put forward a um, hypothesis for how these viruses may have come to be. So if we look at um, this paper here, which has a great title of Grand Theft DNA, Dr. Sedden always says he's surprised that the journal editors let him get away with that. I think it's pretty clever, but. So the way that we're proposing that this may have come to, that this virus may have come to be evolutionarily um, is through basically an RNA capture. So there's the postdoc in our lab has um, other ideas, but this is the one that I think is easiest to um, present for now. So at some point, somehow, a single-stranded DNA virus and a single-stranded RNA virus were likely co-infecting some cell. And somehow, probably during the replication process, this single-stranded DNA virus accidentally or however, somehow incorporated the RNA capsid protein into its genome. So at this point, this genome truly would have been a hybrid of DNA and RNA. At some point, there was a reverse transcription event. It's fairly common in cells, right? We saw that's one, one necessary part of DNA replication. Um, so now we have a fully DNA genome, but we have two capsid proteins. We don't need two capsid proteins to be a successful virus. It's probably detrimental. So through the loss of the original DNA capsid protein, we're now left with single-stranded DNA virus that has rep protein, looks like it's from single-stranded DNA viruses, but a capsid protein that looks like it's from RNA viruses. So we're going to skip through here. Um, the takeaway from these slides is that replication of single-stranded DNA genome seems to be an attractive time for um, acquisition of an RNA capsid protein. So here's um, title, Dr. Sedman's paper. You can go out and find it if you're interested in more. So I mentioned that this was the first virus that was found confirmed to be true in metaviromic data and the first one cloned out of, of samples. And so since then, people have gone back and looked at metaviromic data. They've gone out to environments and they've been able to um, both clone some of these viruses and find a whole bunch more of them in metaviromic data. So 
the patterns that are emerging from the now, I guess this should say May 2019 now, from the now, I think it's 468 examples of these types of viruses that we, we have, are that the rep protein come from various single-stranded DNA viruses. So we have viruses with rep proteins that look like rep proteins from Gemini viruses, rep proteins that look like the ones that are found in circoviruses, rep proteins that look like ones that are found in other classes of single-stranded DNA viruses, the nanoviruses, which also infect plants. So these seem to have been acquired multiple times in multiple different patterns. And even now, as we're looking at things that looks like, probably the rep protein can even be um, shared, halves of it can be shared among, among these viruses. But the thing that may, remains consistent is that the capsid protein always seems to be from Thomas viruses, those single-stranded DNA plant viruses implies that there was probably one acquisition of this capsid protein, followed by multiple rearrangements of both the whole entire rep protein and just partial parts of it. So what have we done? We've done some studies where we've gone out into environments and we bring back DNA, and we amplify DNA um, in a manner that selects for single-stranded DNA, and we're able to clone these viruses into just other plasmids. So we linear, linearize these genomes and clone them into plasmids, and then we're able to sequence them, elucidate um, information about what their capsid proteins look like, what their rep proteins look like. So we found, I guess, three now um, from Woodburn peat bog, which is 45 minutes south of here. Um, about, I guess, a year and a half ago, there was a paper published by a group, I think they're actually on the East Coast, but they were looking at isopods off the coast of Oregon. And what they were able to find and show is that these crucivirus-like sequences, the hybrid virus-like sequences, are oftentimes found in association with marine isopods. Um, and what they hypothesized is that because of the patterns that they were finding um, these genome sequences, the patterns that they found them associated with the marine isopods is that they're likely not infecting the isopods, but probably associated with something that lives on the isopod itself, probably some kind of protozoan. Okay, so what else are we interested in? What are we studying about these cruciviruses? We're trying to figure out how does a single-stranded single RNA-like capsid package single-stranded DNA? You would think that the relationship between a capsid and a particular nucleic acid should be pretty strict, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case um, here. We're interested in biogeography, so we um, are putting together phylogenetic analyses that take into account where these other viruses have been found, evolutionary relationships follows from that. Um, we're looking at that mechanism, potential mechanism of recombination that I mentioned a few slides ago. How does a DNA virus acquire an RNA virus gene? We're interested in structures of these viruses. We don't know what a host is. We're interested in that. And maybe those other open reading frames have some sort of important function that we're we're missing because they don't have any homology to things in the database. Okay, so the last slide. So we've talked about a whole bunch of different single-stranded DNA viruses today. The question is why would something choose to exist as a single-stranded DNA virus? So kind of as an aside, um, with the advent of, of the, the next-gen sequencing technologies, it's become apparent that single-stranded DNA viruses are a lot more common than they were thought to be 30, 40 years ago. So it seems like single-stranded DNA would be an inefficient way to exist as a virus, right? Because you need double-stranded DNA intermediate to be made. You need cells to be in the S phase in order to induce a successful infection. It seems like this would be less than ideal, right? Single-stranded DNA is also a 
target for degradation, right? Because when does single-stranded DNA show up? It shows up when DNA damage has occurred. So one of the things that we're interested in is do single-stranded DNA viruses, for whatever reason, possess something that allows them to readily recombine with other viruses, including RNA viruses? So I would say that based on the patterns that we're seeing, at least in the, the rep protein, there is something to be said for this hypothesis. And of course it follows that being able to sample the capsid protein range would be evolutionarily advantageous because you, um, the capsid protein generally determines what cells you can infect. So if you can infect novel cells that you haven't been infecting for millions of years and co-evolving with, you can effectively broaden your host range, potentially avoid immune responses. So there might be um, unseen advantages of being a single-stranded DNA virus. Right, and so then just what we covered associated with RDHV, and I realize now that I said RDHV to begin with, but it's now been proposed that we call these viruses Cruci viruses to avoid the confusion that comes with the hybrid word. So Cruci, a cross, right, between um, RNA and DNA viruses. Then on the very last slide, which I won't show, there's a, a more detailed um, diagram of rolling circle replication if you're interested in taking a look at that. So, too late, two minutes late.